all to come to see this movie, Lessons in Descent. And first of all, I would like to welcome you again to coming to this, this beginning of the overnight screening festival in CUHK. And in particular, I would like to welcome members from Scorism on the left side of the assembly, assembly hall. <laughs> Thank you. We will begin the discussion panel uh, for an hour. And before the Q&A sessions, uh, first of all, I would like to share some of my thoughts in this film. And I think it has, it's really meaningful to, film, to screen this film in CUHK because many of the contributors in the film come from this campus, come from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. You can see there are many journalists, activists, and students studying in the campus. They are all the legacy of this campus contributing the democratic movement in Hong Kong. And I'm moved because, not simply because I can see my face, but I can also find there are lots of enthusiastic students, teachers, and journalists, and the citizens fighting for the Hong Kong's democracy. So, so I would like to first ask a question to Matthew. Apart from the narratives of Majai and Joseph Wong, I also find you try to deliver a critical message on the mainstream social movement in Hong Kong, but in particular for the vigil on the 4th of June and even for the 1st July rally. Can you share with us more about your views on these mainstream social actions? Yeah, I think um, the, the film you know, has two very different characters who have two very different views on the mainstream social movement. You have uh, Joshua, who essentially partakes in the mainstream movement, uh, participates in the June 4th vigil, um, very actively participates in the July 1st movement. And Marjai, who is much more critical of those movements, I think he's not criticizing those movements per se. He's being critical of people who only participate in those movements. I think what he's saying is, you know, you can't expect Hong Kong to become a better place if you just turn up for like three hours on June 4th or you just go to a march on July 1st. You know, to protect this place, to, you know, keep it in your heart every day, you need to um, cherish it. And that means you need to be vigilant on a day-to-day -day basis, not just twice a year. I guess this... Uh, and our following questions before we start the Q and session like is I guess you have all familiar with this film in the previous news reporters and in the previous uh, previous journalists, and I guess you you will feel that most of the media coverage were focused on Joshua Wong, the founder and the convener of scholarism. However, as Matthew also mentioned, this this film try to characterize two major two major social activists, Joshua Wong and Ma Jai. Can you share with us more on your views on Ma Jai? Yeah, um, actually what's really interesting is when I first I came to Hong Kong and I was meeting people and I thought, ooh, who's gonna be in this film? I decided on Ma Jai first. Um, he was a really dynamic guy. He was participating in what many people regard as the so-called radical movement in Hong Kong. But he was, um, he was different from many of the other activists. He didn't just regurgitate Marx or Rosbier or any of the other political theorists. Uh, he, he sort of read all those and then came up to his own conclusions and he'd actually, uh, off, he, had, he was quite insightful. Uh, and I thought that that was, that was interesting. Uh, and then Mark Joshua was, you know, he wasn't really anybody when I first met him. He was just a kid doing a few protests. It was during the process of the film that he became uh, famous. So I think, uh, you know, people are relatively familiar with the broad outline of Joshua's story. But Marjai and what he contributes, he's showing it as a completely different side to the social activist movement. He's showing you the behind the scenes, the uh, the day to day, the unglamorous side of it. And I think you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, leaders they need a team of people uh, to follow them or to be doing work. And Joshua's you know 
it's not to say anything negative about what he's doing. It's just to say that you know you, you don't have to be like him. There's loads of other roles in the movement that you can you can be part of and that you can do, uh, just like Marjai. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Um, I guess we can now go to an open floor discussion. Please raise your hand if you have comments, uh, if you have questions, and even your feelings uh, about the theme, and even about the two characters. And please don't be hesitate to speak. You can speak in Chinese or English, and I can do the translation. Please feel free to share your comments, your questions, your feelings. Yes, me too. Please wait for the mic. This my microphone. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Thank, thank you very much. I think uh, for bringing this in very inspirational movie to all of us tonight. Um, my question will be on. So, could you share with us a bit more on why you started this movie? So, what inspired you? And so, when you did the casting, so you picked Magic and Joshua Wong. Uh, that was the time before Joshua was even known to Hong Kong people. So when did you, do, when did you decide on these two characters and why? So, uh, so that would be my first question. Actually, my second one would be on, so what do you want to achieve by this movie? Um, so I, I chose Ma Jai because I, was, I came to Hong Kong and I was wanting to make a film um, about Hong Kong's political system, which you know is kind of a crazy system. You know, we have a situation where what more than a million people cast a vote for a pandem, uh, pandemocrat, legco member. Um, you know, in the 2012 election that you just saw part of, uh, it's you know 56%, and yet they only get 27 seats out of 70, you know, there's a massive disconnect there. And I was interested very much in, in these societies where there are trappings of democracy, but they're not democratic. So you have, um, you know, where there's elections, but the outcome is not actually reflecting the will of the people. Um, because, you know, democracy is not elections. That's just one element of it. So that was what kind of interested me. But then when I came to Hong Kong and I was trying to, to, to tell that story, I realized that really what was far more interesting uh, were these young people who were just so much more dynamic and that they were doing things rather than just talking about things. And you know, when it comes to film, uh, action speaks louder than words. I mean, that's just basic film grammar. So it seemed like the natural choice in the end to, to to follow this young, these young people in their new movements. Um, but, uh, you know, Ma Jai, I think what I was really interested in him when I first picked him, because I picked him first, was, you know, Hong Kong, they talk about him being radical. You know, he's like one of these so-called radicals. But what does he do that's radical? Nothing. You know, my mum, a 60-year-old middle-aged white woman, is more radical than he is. <laughs> You know, it's just, and I wanted to sort of say, hey, what is this radicalness that we're so, that we say in Hong Kong is so bad? Anyone who has kind of a view which isn't sort of uh, conforming to a very moderate uh, opinion is deemed as kind of some kind of outcast. So that, that interested me because I wanted to show that he isn't some bad kid, uh, there's some radical bad boy. He's actually a really good kid, a really nice guy who cares deeply about what's going on in Hong Kong, and he's given up a lot to, to do that. Uh, so that was kind of the inspiration. It was just about trying to show how messed up the system in Hong Kong is, and how that's quite unclear to, certainly to Westerners, but even to Hong Kongers. I think many people don't kind of grasp. They think, oh, I go to election, I vote for a district councillor, or I vote for a LegCo member. But, you know, the result isn't really a true reflection of public opinion. So that was the inspiration, and that was the reason why I chose Marjai. And Joshua, I met him, and he, he was, it was a very, very low-key um, 
very low-key protest. There wasn't really that many people there. They were sort of chanting some slogans, singing some Beyond songs. You know, it was the same old faces that you see at sort of all these protests. And I, uh, I, I kind of wasn't really that interested. And I thought, nah, this isn't exciting. Marja is exciting. Joshua, mm, no. And then he comes and speaks on the microphone. And I'm like, wow, who is this kid? Uh, and he's like, only 14. And uh, I just thought, wow, OK. And then I realized that these two kids went to the same school. And they, they grew up in the same neighborhood. And it just seemed you know, that, that that could be a nice parallel. And I had seen this film that was a very big hit in the documentary world in the 1990s called Hoop Dreams, which kind of did the same with two kids in Chicago, but not about politics, it was about basketball. And I always thought, ah, oh, you know, follow two kids and follow them through their lives for a few years and just see how it transpires. And what you actually have is you have Marjai, who starts off as a so-called radical, but actually is incredibly moderate because he participates in the election, which, you know, he's participating within the electoral system, the political system in Hong Kong. You don't get any more moderate than that. And then you have Joshua, who starts off so-called moderate. He won't participate in any civil disobedience. But he actually ends up becoming incredibly radical, and he just swipes away the political system and says, I'm not going to participate in elections. I'm just going to get loads and loads of people on the street, because that will speak louder. I think it's quite an interesting, I hope it makes people think about what is radical, what is moderate, and why do I feel that I must be one or the other, or why is it a problem that one person might not have a view which is the same. Okay. Is there any other comments, questions, or just simply share your thoughts? I guess I can ask one follow-up question. Is in your view, what is radical, what is moderate in your sense? And does Hong Kong, does Hong Kong social movement or even the local citizens, they realize the importance of so-called radicalism? Well, I mean, Hong Kong is not radical at all. Um, it's incredibly moderate. Even uh, Sam and Lin or, or People Power, you know, they, you know, what are they doing? Pushing some barriers. It's, you know, when I think back to my parents' generation and what they were doing to fight for civil liberties, uh, civil rights, so that black people had equal opportunities with white people, uh, you know, that gay people had equal opportunities to straight people, you know, they, they were doing so much more radical things. Um, and here it just seems that you know, you're ostracized from society for doing something which is really very mild. And that intrigues me because it sort of, I want to confront that kind of mentality and just say, well, what's that about and how did that come about? And I think it's a sort of socialization of you know, uh, society that's been, it's been pushed into that, having that sort of mentality that you, know, you shouldn't rock the boat, you shouldn't even think about anything more, um, more extreme. That's why you use one phrase in one of the lessons in the film is called Wo Lei Fei Fei. Uh, rational, harmonious, non-violent, no, no foul languages. Do you, think, do you think the opposition camp in all the oppositions in Hong Kong should bear such responsibility of trying to harmonize local movement. And the result is, it seems, people are starting being suspicious to democratizations and even to the democratic movement in Hong Kong. I think any attempt to harmonize things is completely anti-democratic. The whole point of democracy is that everyone's voice is equal, whether you're Li Ka Shing with all your billions, or if you're just a guy on Sham Shui Po with one dollar in your pocket. So, why should you have a harmonized view? Why should you have the same view? Why should one person decide this is what we're going to do and we should all follow that view? I reject that completely. I see. I guess there are, there are people raise, raise hands. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm a, a Chinese university student I'm studying Chinese language and literature. And so, Matthew, I want to ask you uh, three questions. Um, um, your film is a documentary, it's obvious. And then I want to ask about how could you strike a balance between realism and 
cons uh, your consideration of making a good like filming angle because I saw one of your scenes, uh, Joshua is sitting um, in the last row of the church, but maybe um, uh, every weekend uh, he might be um, sitting with the people, but when you are filming him, he, uh, he is uh, sitting in the last row. Are you requesting him in order to have a better um, screening angle or just um, maybe it's your, his intention to help you to um, fight for a film angle? Because um, I don't know if you have um, heard about KJ, the film that is, I think is filmed last few years, and then it's about a pian uh, piano prodigy. And he uh, catching, and then he um, it, he was being interviewed like um, last uh, in the last few months, and I I have read the interview, and he said that um, he will uh, do some exaggerating actions or like speak some exaggerating words in order to make the film like uh, worth uh, more eye. It's more eyeball catching. So, uh, is there any? Um, is is the phenomenon exists in your uh, when you are filming? And the last question. Sorry. <laughs> uh, 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 can, I, can I just ask to answer those? Because otherwise, I'll forget what you just said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the reason for having Joshua stood at the back of the church was not my choice. Um, basically, the church. They've never let anyone film there before. TVB, other people have asked, and they've always said no. Uh, so we were very, very lucky for them to say yes. But the precondition was that everybody else's face wasn't visible. And that actually made it quite difficult if Joshua was in his usual position of being at the front in the crowd. So the compromise we came up with was that he sort of sat at the back, which, you no, know, it doesn't maybe feel quite right, because it, but, you know, you, unfortunately when you're making a film you end up having to make lots of compromises along the way uh, just to try and get it thing made. Uh, but in terms of realism or exaggeration, no, we didn't do anything like that. I, I always said to the kids, you know, just be who you are. I don't want to exaggerate anything or, or make it unreal. Uh, I mean, if you watch the film, I mean, come on, this is not the greatest filmed film. It's very raw. It's uh, the camera, you know, we were in the thick of it all the time. Um, you know, it was crazy most of the time. So uh, it wasn't, it's not, I wouldn't describe it as a beautiful film. It's just a raw film. I hope that helps to answer that question. And then the third question was? And the question, third question is that I saw you uh, adopt Wyman and um, Zach's lyrics in your film. And why do you use the approach? I wanted to speak to Hong Kongers, you know. I could have said some, put something in English. Um, but, you know, this film is for Hong Kong people. It's not for Westerners. Uh, you know, I don't believe that if you, if, you film, if you film Hong Kongers, you put them on film and then you don't make it for them, what are you really doing then? That's Orientalism, that's titillation. It's exotica. I didn't want to do that. So I hope this film is, you know, people realize like, by having interesting t chapter titles that we sort of locked into popular culture here. Uh, you know, I had a lot of help. You know, I, I, am the, I might be the director, but essentially making a film is not, it, it's not like a painting. It's not a solo exercise. It's a very collaborative process. And I had a lot of good people helping me who, you know, are Hong Kongers who came up with these ideas. I mean, I hope you like the high auntie. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I like that one a lot. <laughs> okay. Okay. Is there any other questions? Uh, can, help us, can I help us give the microphone, please? Thank you, Matthew. I want to share some feeling and also ask two questions. First of all, uh, I really appreciate you provide another different angle in looking at the democracy of Hong Kong because usually you will film of you can film other adult or other political heroes. It be it would be very easy to to make a same kind of vision or provide same kind of angle to watch. 
the democracy of Hong Kong, but you choose another angle, it's from those young kids. And I think this really inspired me a lot, especially when I look at one of the shots. I would really want to know what is your feeling when you hear that the teacher say, said that uh, we should be the adult to take the responsibility instead of the young kids to take the responsibility to help to improve the democracy of Hong Kong. What is your feeling when you hear these questions or, or this sentence? And also the second one. Let, let me answer that one okay. first. Okay, so well, one of the reasons why we chose a different route was because I am kind of got fed up of watching BBC documentaries where some foreign correspondent, he comes to Hong Kong, stays in the Mandarin Oriental, you know, hangs out in the mid-levels, speaks to Tan Yok Sing and maybe Martin Lee, and then he comes back and he makes a quick report and says, oh, everything's okay in Hong Kong. And I wanted to say, hey, actually, that's not what's going on here. And uh, why are you guys not waking up, like in England, I mean? Um, so I wanted to do something different, and that was really why we went with the kids. But this, the, the school teacher, James Hong, I mean, I, I, I agree with what he says, but what, what, he's, what I think he's saying or in, in the body of the film is we adults have let the kids down. The older generation has let the younger generation down. They have not protected them. You know, look at it. Joshua, when I first met Joshua, he had just started scholarism. And over, for an over a year, he was battling uh, with, you know, no other help. Luckily, reinforcements come in at the end. But it shouldn't have been like that. It really shouldn't have been. Um, and I think... You know, this is why we called the film Lessons in Descent, because essentially these kids, they're meant to be at school. They're meant to be the ones getting lessons from the adults. That's what we do in our socialized society where kids are told your place is not to speak out. Your place is to learn, go to school, go to tutorial class and don't say anything. And actually what we've got instead is we've got a load of kids who are giving a lesson to Hong Kong. They're giving a lesson to the adults and they're saying, actually, you know, this is our place, this is our town. We love Hong Kong and we're going to protect it because you haven't done so. I think uh, it's a wake up call. And the second question is, when you are tracking the whole process of the democracy, you will find that it's very interesting. There's one kind of majority and one kind of minority the minority will be those lack of support like Ma Chai and the majority may be some using the social media to make it as a hero, to, to make it a, have a bigger influence. And throughout the checking process, will you think that the freedom or the, is there any improvement, real improvement in Hong Kong democracy? No. Hong Kong's democracy is being sold bit by bit, day by day by the people who should be protecting it. Uh, we have to hope that the younger generation, uh, you guys basically, stand up and look after it and save the bits you've got left and fight for some more. Um, you know, I'm not here to say, you know, you should do this, you should do that. Uh, I just tried to make a film where I reflected uh, the sentiment of a younger generation who, who seemed, to, you know, what makes you a Hong Konger? You know, this is what kind of makes me interested. You know, this is, uh, what does it mean to be Hong Kong Chinese in post-1997 Hong Kong? You know, what is your identity and where, uh, you know, how do you form your identity? This place, this city, this amazing city is what makes you who you are. It gives you your personality. You know, the language, Cantonese, you know, it's a um, fun, colorful language and yet, People want to teach everything in Putonghua. I have no problem with Putonghua, but why can't it be in this additional language, just like English is an additional language? You know, it's, it's kind of like me having to do my classes in German or something. It just seems like your identity of who you are is under attack. And I just like the fact that these kids are willing to stand up for it and not make any concessions, um, because it just seemed like the older generation, the ones who've been around for a long time, they've been ground down. They've had their resistance pushed down and now they're no longer 
fighting with all their might. They're just too tired, I think, which is understandable. But now maybe it's time for the young kids to take up the mantle and fight it. Yes, there are questions. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, would, I would just like to share my feelings on this uh, documentary. And when I, when I was watching it, I feel that although there ha it has been some efforts to put uh, the story of Joshua and Majah together as jointly, but I find that uh, during the uh, filming process, Joshua himself is very outspoken and he has a very strong ability in presenting himself. And comparatively speaking, Majah is strong in action, but relatively uh, weaker, than, uh, weaker in uh, organizing his own ideas. But under the, under the filming process, you can clearly make an impression that Joshua is much uh, visible in this documentary. And I, I personally want to appreciate that this is, the, this is a movie for the society and also for the record of the youth social movement. But for some, for some people, I guess, it will make, the, make them the feeling that Joshua is the main character. In, the, in this documentary. And it's somehow Maja is just like, a, I don't know, supporting or just an, an other uh, secondary figure in that. So how would you comment on the reconciliation of the, these uh, two main figures uh, in your storytelling? I think we need to define what is weaker. Um, you know, that seems to me, you know, we're in this sort of zero-sum game terminology where we talk about one as a winner or one as a loser, one is stronger or one is weaker. I don't think Marjai is weaker at all. I don't think he's uh, any less of a social activist or any of his contributions are in any way less than Joshua. I think he's actually um, doing just as much and his role is just as important. Um, but, you know, obviously Joshua is very, very eloquent. Uh, but, you know, we can't all be like that. Uh, you know, I'm not like that. Um, I really like Marjai. I find that he, you know, him and I, we like, I had a lot in common with him. And I, I really enjoyed spending time with him. And he, what he's doing is so important for, for Hong Kong. You know, by you know, people like, Man Yun in the film, you know, he, they're trying, but, you know, with, uh, with Ma Jai's support, you know, we have to have people support, you know, it doesn't matter what political party it is, but, you know, you can't just be, you can't just go run for election and then expect to win without having a huge group of people supporting you. It's like this film, I have a huge, well, not huge, but I have a group of people who are doing a lot to, to try and help us. It's always a concerted team effort. So I think uh, what Majai is doing is, is really important, and I wouldn't describe it in weaker or stronger terms. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. And, and uh, referring to what you said, I think um, I should use Chinese in the, in the rest of the question, because um, we are Chinese, yeah. Uh, 我想問幾個問題嘅,thank you for your translation. Yeah. 第一個問題是,為何要選香港這個地方來去做這個拍攝的地方呢?是否有什麼淵源呢?你跟香港一樣? 第二個問題呢,就是,或者你可以請他答咗第一個問題。Why did I choose Hong Kong? I chose Hong Kong because A, I already had an interest. I'd, uh, I'd fallen in love with Hong Kong movies when I was a kid. You know, John Wu, uh, Chow Yun Fat, uh, Wong Ga Wei, you know, all these movies, they kind of they were the films I grew up with that I really was passionate about and I really enjoyed. So coming to Hong Kong was not really um, was like a pilgrimage to my movie heroes. So, and I'd, I'd been coming to Hong Kong for a long time. I previously lived here. So it wasn't, it wasn't a place I didn't not know. But I guess what really interested me after... Uh, so 
Although I came here because of movies or because I loved the films, when I arrived in Hong Kong in 2003, it was a time of great turmoil. You had SARS, Article 23, Leslie Cheung had just died, uh, and Lisa Moy then died at the end of the year. It was almost a terrible time. Everyone was just like, oh my God. And I, um, it just intrigued me that here was a city in turmoil. You know, there was an identity crisis at, you know, not a national, but a city level rather than individual level. And that was very, very intriguing. Um, and it kind of stayed with me over the last 10 years. I continue to want to read up and understand and, and try to grasp, like, how could this great place that I really enjoyed just on a visual level of, it's a fun place to be, um, but the people seem to be undergoing an identity crisis. And I, you know, if you look at the films of the 80s and the 90s, which I grew up with, which I liked so much, they were very much about ident Hong Kong identity. What, what is going on, you know, uh, A Better Tomorrow, which I think they're showing at the Hong Kong Film Festival on Sunday or Monday. You know, that's one of my all-time favorite movies, but really what's, what is going on, you've got, you know, a guy who stands up for his moral beliefs. You know, they might be gangsters in that film, but he has a moral code. The other guy, the bully, has junked his moral code and is now just behaving like some kind of common criminal rather than a, a, a triad man of code. Now that, if that's not an allegory for Hong Kong and its relationship with the mainland, then I don't know what is. Uh, you know, there is a man here, you know, Hong Kong, standing up for its moral principles versus uh, a big bully which has basically junked its moral view of opinions and it just can, feels like it can buy anything. Uh, so those are the films that I grew up with. Those are the films that are, I don't know, influenced me. When I was a teenager, those are the films that I enjoyed watching. They worked at a level that was good for, if I was a teenager, just navigating high school, you know, standing up to bullies. There was that kind of just personal level interest. But as I became more knowledgeable about Hong Kong, I realized it was much more about a wider society issue and facing up to the fact that the handover was coming and how would they treat, how was it going to go? But then when I realized, came here in 2013, uh, 2003, I realized, well, there's another identity crisis happening now after the handover. People are wondering what are we and who are we and what we're doing. And there wasn't a film about it, or the, there were some films about it, but I just, I thought maybe I could do something too. So that was why I became interested and that's why I wanted to do something. But I've also always been interested in these places that have some trapping of democracy but aren't. I think that's a very interesting paradox. Uh, 即是政治的參與,但 I do not think Hong Kong people are politically indifferent. Look at the events of 2012. You know, 120,000 people turn up to fight against national education. Uh, the events of, of the film, I think, show that Hong Kong people aren't politically indifferent, that they aren't apathetic. I think instead you've been told by colonial masters, both pre and post handover, that you are politically indifferent, that your opinion shouldn't matter, so don't have one. Uh, and I, I completely disagree with Hong Kong being people are politically apathetic. I don't think there's, that, that is the case at all. I think Hong Kong people are clever, mature, educated, wise, and perfectly capable of making up their own decisions on political things. Whether they agree with me or not, it doesn't matter. They're, they're perfectly capable of coming up with their own views. I don't think they're politically indifferent. 
violence? I, I don't think there's a need necessarily to be violent. I'm not talk, I don't think when we talk about radicalism, you know, this word violent. I remember uh, Miriam Lau, Liberal Party, you know, she was going, oh, you know, we don't want uh, these, these violent people. And then there was Pamela Peck and she talked about civilized democracy. Well, who's violent? I didn't see any violence in my film apart from the police pepper spraying all the kids. And what were they doing? Just sitting behind some barriers. I mean, you know, it's this, and then the media will say, oh, look at these bad kids, they're causing trouble. And, and, and people don't challenge it. People don't think, why am I being told this? You know, when I watch the BBC at home, I sit there and I think, what a lot of rubbish, most of the time. I don't believe what I'm being told. You read between the lines, uh, read multiple news sources. Um, and I think in Hong Kong, it's, I don't know why, you know, I understand why the government wants you to think that anyone who protests is a bad person because it just makes their life a lot easier. You know, we want a harmonious society in Hong Kong. Uh, but I don't think necessarily we need to be violent. But I think we need to be vigilant. I think we need to be aware of um, the forces of darkness which are working to erode your rights supposedly enshrined in the basic law. Um, and I think if you're vigilant to them, then there would be no need to be violent to protect them. And I think if you look through uh, you know, history, when, anything, when a kind of a revolution happens that's violent, it always ends up going bad. So you know, violence should only be ever the very, very last resort. Um, you know, I think my hope for Hong Kong is that you know, just through a bit of unity, a bit of people talking to each other, working together, um, you know, not having some person who says, I know best, I will dictate to all you other people, but actually a real true dialogue between all the different pandem groups, then maybe something can actually happen and we can have a breakthrough. Um, so I don't think violence is necessarily the answer. Yes. Uh, my name is Patrick, first year engineering student at CUHK. Uh, my question is that uh, in the movie, these two characters demonstrate two different style of uh, doing the social movement. Uh, Joshua Wong did it in a very high profile style, and Ma Jai did it in a very low par uh, profile. But, uh, so my question is, which style do you prefer? Uh, which style do you think is going to be more effective in Hong Kong in fighting for uh, the, a democratic system? I, I, again, I, it goes back to not picking one. You know, why do we have to have a zero-sum game where we pick one? one it, it, that's suggesting that one is correct and the other is incorrect. Oh, I, I chose both to include both because I don't subscribe to the view that one is right and one is wrong. They're both right. And how about, which one do you predict to be, uh, a, a, to be adopted by the majority of Hong Kong to uh, keep uh, in the future of uh, fighting for de uh, the democracy? Again, I, I just don't think we need to be adopting a, a majority view. Why cannot two ways coexist at the same time? I think they both have their very useful uh, elements. Uh, and I, I don't think, you know, again, this goes back to what is democracy? If democracy is about everybody's voice being of equal value, then that means that what both Marjai and Joshua do is of equal value. Uh, it's, so it's not saying one is right and one is wrong, because the moment you choose to say, I think this is the right way, you're then excluding all other people who have a different view. I have a lady here. Hello, I'm going to speak Chinese. I think that in Hong Kong, this society, for the young people, this is something that is very similar to the same. 佢一方面會同你講啊，你有青春，你嘗試去試唔同嘅嘢，但係同時佢哋又期望一個年輕嘅人已經會有住
誒、呃、唔同嘅成就，或者又最起碼有一般嘅成就。咁我想問一下誒、呃、導演，你對於青春啊、年輕啊呢一啲嘅睇法係點樣咧？唔該。I I think,、uh, for instance, in Hong Kong, there is too much emphasis on Academic achievement. I'm not, you know, obviously I did okay at school,、uh, and I would like my children to do okay at school. I'm not saying that academics doesn't matter, but I think, as you see from the film, what Joshua does,、uh, you know, you can not deny he's a clever kid with great potential. Likewise for Marjai, and yet they haven't, you know, Marjai has not subscribed to standard. Uh, politi- you know, standard educational norms,、uh, and I think in Hong Kong it's it's okay to reject the norm. Why do we always have to、uh, go down this standardised route where we all make ourselves the same? We're just being socialised. I remember、uh, in 2012, I was when I was filming this, there was a Manulife, you know, the insurance company. They had an advert, and it was like on the MTR, and it had like the stop. All、these different stops in your life, and it was that you were born, you went to school, you went to university, you met a girl, you got married, you bought a house, you bought a car, you got an MBA, you became like you got a promotion, you became CEO. I reject that. I just reject that outright. I,、uh, I don't think that there's any need to follow that route. Everybody is everybody as an individual is important, and therefore, if you choose a different route. You are, you're not becoming less important. You're just as important. So I think the kids who choose a different route、uh, can still be of value, and you don't need to necessarily,、um, you know, you don't need to conform to expectations. You need to be true to who you are.、Uh, you know, I, w- I remember being. I used to make corporate films before I did this. I made a lot of corporate films. Pay was good. Pay was good. But I wasn't happy at all. I wasn't being true to who I was. I was just making adverts, essentially, for drug companies or oil companies. It's not really what I wanted to do. It didn't. I felt unhappy all the time. Making this film, I've been penniless the whole time, but I've been a lot happier. And I think you know that's a, the, the idea: is choose your route. You know, it doesn't have to be materialistically、uh, of value, it, but it can be of great worth. Well, it's quite a good film indeed, and I do appreciate it and your political thoughts as well. And I want to ask more about the film production matter. Um, how your political thoughts is formed? Because I think that it's quite localized, as a、uh, Hong Kongers thought. Because、uh, we also. You also match our political force that we need democracy, we need freedom, and how we perform the、um, social movement as well. And when do you inspire so, such a political force? And another question is, what do you think、uh, the major success reason for your film、uh, in the、uh, film festival? So, sorry. So, what do I think is the major success of the film in the film festival?、Um, you, as a director, what、uh, do you think、uh, the most, the major success point of your film?、Oh, so、the major success point of my film is people like you coming to watch it. <laughs> um. I could have been a rich man doing other things. This, doing stuff like this doesn't make you a rich man at all, but you know it makes me happy to see people come and just want to watch it.、Uh, so that that's just the greatest success. So I hope more people will come and watch it, and if they do, then I'll be very happy. Um, hello, I'm Sandy from、um, Year One Medical Students.、Um, thank you so much for bringing us this movie, and it's really inspiring, and it's really make the stories last. Not only in history, but also in the filming industry. And 
Thank you for members of the scholarism to protect and to strive for our city. And I got a very simple question. Um, what do, what's your suggestion for us as university students, as teenagers, as Hong Kong citizens to work for our future? Or as, to put it simple, what are your words for us? Listen to what Ma Jai says at the very end of the film. I think Ma Jai is very wise. He says, you need to be vigilant. You need to remember and be, raise the awareness. You need to hold Hong Kong dear in your heart. And, uh, you know, it's about being aware of things every day. So I think as a student, you know, you guys, this is what your job is to do, is to look after society. Um, that's, that's what historically students are supposed to have done. For some reason, when we become adults, we get all conservative and we uh, forget our young idealistic views. But you should hold on to them dearly and, and do what Joshua and Marjai have done. You know, join them. Are there any questions? Yes, there's about the gentleman. So thank you, Matthew, for bringing us an interesting movie. Tonight, so uh, I have a question uh, concerning the the movie title. So you use Mei Gao Cheng. So uh, for di for direct translation, meaning under aged, uh, under the, the adult age. So uh, actually, in in this Chinese terms, it it, it have some slightly negative attitude. Yeah, yeah, for this term. So do you, do do. You, uh, is it your intention to use this term to build up a uh, parallelism with the with the with the fact that uh, many Hong Kong people think that oh it's not good uh, it's a bit negative for for some kids to go for a, a political uh, uh, movement is it your intention? Yeah, the title is ironic. You know, uh, supposedly we are told young people do not have enough weight or do not have enough value uh, to make comment on society. They should be at school studying and until they've learned everything in their textbooks, their opinions are worthless. I don't think so. I think uh, these kids, you know, it's, it's an ironic title. These kids are completely worth their weight in gold. Uh, you know, not just them, the whole generation they represent, that means you guys too. Um, and, you know, we, we need to really, st I, I, we use that title because it was ironic, but it's kind of also challenging this social stereotype that we have in Hong Kong, which is that young people don't matter, and that young people's views are somehow less important. And I think uh, by using that title, we challenge that, because obviously I don't believe that to be the case. So uh, I have a follow-up. Uh, actually, I have another suggestion, uh, a comment for this movie. So uh, you are focusing on the anti-government uh, political view to uh, make up this film. So uh, do, do you, would you have any plan to work on the opposite, of, opposite side, uh, namely the, the pro-government uh, uh, government parties? Oh, actually, I totally disagree with those uh, pro-government uh, parties, but I want to know more about their logic because their logic <laughs> seems to seems to me that they're they're insensible, Ill illogical. But I would like to know more about what they are really thinking for their 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 thought of democracy in Hong Kong. I would love to do something with caring Hong Kong power, yeah, yeah. Or, or maybe uh, Hong Kong youth care. <laughs> I have a feeling they might not like me. <laughs> but I, I've always felt, you know, my mum told me when I was a kid, if the government likes you, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> uh, you know, don't become a member of the establishment. Uh, so I can't believe those guys would want to talk to me in the first place, but if they did, Here's an open invitation. I would love to work with them, absolutely. <laughs> I think uh, showing them up for what they are would be a lot of fun. Okay, thank you. Yes, there's another lady. I guess we have last two questions.
Um, I'm just sharing my opinion and feelings about it this movie. Uh, I want to say that I really like your ideas playing around with the idea of uh, radicalism and being moderate. And I guess I want to give an account of why Hong Kong people are so moderate. Uh, I think Hong Kong people are not apathetic about politics. It's just that they are not very educated about politics. Um, yes, Hong Kong is a very economically developed society, but we are still a newborn baby in politics. So um, we are being moderate because we don't know what if we are wrong? What if we are making mistakes? Well, we, um, what other people would look at us if we are being radical? So I think it is not, we are just I agree with you. I think what you, you brought up something really interesting because what I would say is I think you said Hong Kong is still a newborn baby when it comes to politics, even though it's highly developed economically. But I think the question then lies, why? Why is Hong Kong still a newborn baby when it comes to politics? I think it comes down to colonialism. Not just British colonialism, but also what we currently have, which is, you know, Hong Kong is still a colony. It's just a colony of People's Republic of China, as opposed to the UK. And colonialism, the way it works is, you know, keep people, try to make them apathetic by telling them their views don't matter. So, you know, even when I was on the MTR, just like today, uh, the discourse, the language used uh, is embedded in your mind. So, for instance, it tells me, oh, be careful because it's rained outside. Do not, you do not want to slip in the MTR. Or please do not look at your mobile phone when you're on the escalator. <laughs> it's like you guys are adults. Hong Kong people are adults. But you're, you're spoken to like kids by, by a government, by both pre and post handover governments. And uh, I think you know, we need to start rejecting that because it's this mentality that C.Y. Leung and the government and Carrie Lam and all those guys up there, that, that they are the parents who look after this nice young flock of people. And then up in Zhongnanhai, we have grandpa. <laughs> well, you know, I think uh, that is, that, that is in, you know, using the discourse, the language that they use continually, it, it emasculates Hong Kong people of their, uh, their adulthood. And I think, you know, there's actually someone, if someone wants to do a thesis on the language used by Hong Kong government, I think it would be very, very interesting. The, the, the use of discourse is, is fascinating. And I just want to lay this on your heart. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying that all moderate people are just being ignorant about politics, but uh, I think it's totally fine being moderate when you, to, uh, when you, when you know what you're doing. For example, the Occupying Central, uh, initiators, uh, the, they know what they want to do for Hong Kong. And I just want to say, uh, I was totally apathetic about politics uh, two years ago, but after the dog strike, after the national education, I'm now majoring in politics, and I'm proud of it. So Joshua and Marjai have had a small victory then? Yes. Good. Yes, I, ask. Uh, I want to ask because uh, I see uh, Joshua's family in a in a film, but not Marjai. Is, is it he is not really supported by his family? I think you do see Marjai's family, maybe not his parents, but you see his family, the family that looks after him, Sam and Lin. They're there the whole time. Yeah. They uh, they look after a lot of kids who come drifting through their doors. So it's a different type of family dynamics. That's what I'm asking. So is it because of like his, you know, what I'm saying? Like, is it not supported by his nucleus family? No, I think his mum and dad are supportive of what he does. Uh, they didn't want to participate in the film for their own reasons. Um, but actually, you know, I haven't really met them very much. So, I, I, what I tried to portray in the film was actually the family life that I see Marjai participating in. Uh, which was very much surrounded with Anau and the other guys there. They, uh, you know, it's, it's a different family life. But again, it goes back to, it's not about one is right, one is wrong. It's just everyone has to find their own way. And, uh, the other question is like, uh, 
because there are different styles, like when they talk about democracy. And how about, I know uh, you appreciate Majai's also, like, but how to say, if his way in, most of the people would say is more radical and they are more composing this way. Uh, how can, if you think this is a very valuable uh, for for the people to fight for it, then but how t how they educate people? It is a, you know, it is worth doing, or we are doing the right thing, or something like that. Because you know, I think to say the truth, uh, before this movie, I don't really know him, but everybody knows Joshua. So how how to if he thinks you know Maja himself thinks this is you know really important, and to people also, you know, it should be. Um, you know their their views as well, but how how you know seven million Hong Kong people to to think about this way as well. I think you know Marjai says in the film, um, Joshua's way. You need to be famous first. We can't all be famous, you know. So we need to find a way that we can do our little bit um, in a way that's possible for us, and that's what Marjai is doing. So it, it's, he's just finding his own way of doing things. But I don't, again, it goes, you know, Joshua does it his thing. I don't necessarily agree with everything he does. Um, likewise for Marjai, but they, they're going their own way. They're choosing their own way. They have the same goal at the end of the day. And before the end of this, discussion panel, I would like to share a little thought. Um, it's, it seems this film is easily interpreted as a Joshua Magi dichotomy. People will judge which approach are more suitable for Hong Kong and more valuable in social mobilization. But in my view, they are complementary. If you think about the Occupy Central movement in current days, I would say if there was no anti-high railway campaign and demonstrations in 2009, 2010 in the Legislative Council, if there were no people occupying the old Legislative Council and, and the Piazza in Central, there may not be such aspirations of occupying Central movement. On the other hand, if there were no Joshua's mobilizations, mass mobilization encouraged more previously political, apathetic citizens coming out, then there will be no opportunity to try to educate or to try channel them into a more radical or even progressive actions. So I guess what you say is right, is if we are in fighting for democracy, first of all, we have to welcome, I have to, I, I, would, I wouldn't use the word tolerate, but we have to welcome all the strategies and approaches, and they are in the same goal and a united goal to fighting for democracies. So that's my little thought in, uh, after this film, after this discussion. And again, thank you for all your contribution and, and thank you for Matthew Tong before the end of this discussion. Let's give a big hand again for the tribute. Joe purity of heart you can see the most beautiful thing in the world. This is Zhou Bo Chong 2014.